It is my great pleasure today to introduce our keynote speaker, Bob Strack, an early adopter of the PhotoVoice method and now chair of public health education at the University of North Carolina, Greensboro. <clears throat> In 2004, Dr. Strack co-authored a paper on the use of photo voice in an after-school program with Baltimore youth that has become a classic, informing photo voice projects around the world for 20 years. That 2004 paper and the many others that Bob has published have consistently informed my own photo voice work and scholarship. But more, much more than that, Bob's warm heart and generous spirit are guiding lights in public health education and the use of photo voice to engage young people and adults in community-informed social change. Dr. Strack received three grants from the National Institutes of Health to support his team in developing a web-based toolkit called Photo Voice Kit, for carrying out photo voice projects that combine photography, dialogue, storytelling, public photo exhibits, and social action to address issues that the community identifies and feels strongly about. In 2020, Dr. Strack published a paper on use of the, I mean, 2010, Dr. Strack published a paper on the use of the socioecological model to understand photo voice impact at different levels from the individuals to groups, programs, communities, and policy, a paper that has informed the topic and call for papers for this conference. I thank Bob for his extensive contributions to our understanding about impactful use of the photo voice method for social change. And I especially thank you, Bob, for your ongoing support of the community of researchers, practitioners, and participants using the amazing method called photo voice to make a positive difference in their communities. Thank you, Bob, for sharing your expertise with us in your keynote speech entitled, Aiming for Impact, What is Your Angle? Take it away, Bob. <laughs> I love that. I've never been introduced like that before. And just so everybody knows, we're not gonna talk about any of that research that Laura is talking about. So um, I think we're ready to go with our slides, Austin. All right, Zach. So yeah, like Laura said, thank you for inviting me to this uh, talk. I'm really excited. We're we're going to talk about things different than photo voice, but certainly related to photo voice. And some of it is just uh, how do we be better humans? And the, really, the focus of my talk is going to be what is what is your angle? And it's really going to be around how do we communicate with each other and how do we want to be impactful? So. I just want to say thank you. I kind of cracked up when I saw the, the picture because I had forgotten that I had sent this particular photo to you to use for the conference. And um, I promise at the end of this talk, I will show you the photo that I was actually taking when I took this shot. My daughter took this picture of me taking a picture of her and I, I saw it in my camera and I thought it was kind of funny. But so we're, gonna, we're really going to talk about your angle. And so that picture reminds me of just what is your angle and what are we trying to frame when we do our work? Um, before we get going, I'm going to ask something of you. I'm going to ask you to get out a piece of paper, and I want you to keep it at hand, and I want you to write down three things that you take away from our time together. And personally, I find that I, I cannot remember all that I take in when I go to a conference or I listen to a talk. So, But if you can capture three things and write them down, they tend to help you remember them and have some takeaways when you're done. And after this talk, I'd really invite you and encourage you to send me the three things you took away so that I can learn myself about what impacted you and what you found useful from our time together. So if you could get a piece of paper and do that together, that'd be great. So since we're talking about photo voice, I have to start with a photo voice slide. But when I think about photo voice, I think of it as a process used for engaging and empowering individuals enhancing community, community participation efforts. And then finally, and most importantly, in my thinking is to encourage public policy change so that we have long-term systems change in our communities. And when I think about photo voice, I really do always remind myself of those three elements, empowering individuals, engaging our community, and having long-term sustainable environmental changes. And when I think about photo voice to kind of frame our conversation, um, one of the papers we wrote, which is revisiting the roots and aims of photo voice, 
really try to capture that and go back to Carolyn Wong and, and Burris's initial contribution that really talked about it in its totality. This timeline is one that I've, or this uh, schema is one that I've used to think about going from an individual level impact, which is the individual intervention of the person being uh, asked to be our co-researcher with you. Obviously, they're going to have changes in themselves. Um, using it as a surveillance tool within a community to document its assets and deficits. So as a surveillance, there's also empowerment happening outside of the photographer, but also in the community. Community building tool, obviously. And then finally, the ultimate, which is the systems level of advocacy change. Advocacy change. But we know from experience, and many of you out there um, know that, you know, that change doesn't always come easy. And so let's get into why that might be the case and have some conversation. So within a photo voice project or within a public health effort, you know, we, we, we often ground things in what we call root causes or the social determinants of health. You're familiar with this model, I'm sure, with the nested systems. And we've taken that and overlaid photo voice within that ecological framework where we are having impact. This is a very similar to the former slide you saw, saw, but we're having impact at the individual level in a personal organizational community. And from that, you get as a photo photovention all the way up to for advocacy. And so when we think about planning and we think about impact, that's the way we typically think about photo voice and how to make a difference. Now, as we think about influence, as we think about trying to get someone to do what is the right thing, I want you to, for the sake of the rest of this conversation, I want you to think about, and maybe you can write this on your piece of paper, two individuals. I want you to think of one individual that means a lot to you, someone who has your back, someone who understands you, someone who you can be vulnerable with. And I want you to write that name down on that piece of paper. That should be an easy one. This other one might even be easier. I don't know. Maybe you'll have to think about it for a minute. But now I want you to think about somebody who frustrates you, somebody who maybe you don't think has your back or doesn't understand you as a person or that you have to convince that your point of view has validity, somebody, probably somebody of power around you or over you or that you know of, but somebody who frustrates you. And I want you to write that name down as well and think about that person and how they construct their life and their mind and their attitudes and values. Think about that person. Since I can't see you, I'm just going to trust that we're doing, are we, are we good out there? Okay. So I want to get into a little bit about the real heart of what we're going to talk about. And that gets down to how we communicate as humans. And when you think about America, and, you, and we're going to couch this in American thinking, but it's certainly true in other countries as well, especially as I look at elections around the world and the resurgence of conservative thinking in other parts of the world um, and the ebb and flow between, I'll call it a progressive collectivist mindset versus an individualistic mindset. That true in America for sure, and it's easy to see, but it's also true in other societies. But for now, we're just going to talk about America and think about American values. And this is for the younger people that are with us. This is John Wayne. You've probably heard the name repeatedly mentioned within political circles, within American mystique. He's sort of a Western pioneer actor that kind of create the, the, the mythic of the great American West and the rugged individualism that makes America, America. But the other thing that makes America America is, or societies in general, collective societies, is the fact that we tend to do things as groups. This is a picture of a barn raising where people, in this case, also in the West, would get together as a community and work to help a farmer build a barn. And then that collective of people would help another farmer build a barn. And so these barn raisings were a community effort because you knew you couldn't do it yourself. You needed people help to help you. So that's also a guiding value within American society. And then within America, you, you know, we've got the military and all the things that that entails and all the other aspects of American society. These form the basis of how we think. Um, but when you think about stories and you think about how stories um, can be influential, um, they become over the arc of history, human history, stories have been observed to be a powerful vehicle for bringing the reluctant individual. The, the reluctant, individual into what Joseph Campbell called the hero's journey, um, the monolithic or template of tales that involve a hero going off on an adventure 
and returning home transformed. And you think about all the stories that you've Frodo and the Lord of the Rings, you know, Luke Skywalker and going off and conquering the evil empire. These are all aspects of what Joseph Campbell calls the hero's journey. And we are all uh, embedded with these kind of mystiques about how we think about ourselves, but also as our leaders in, in political environments. So they become the hero's journey, but we also have our own hero's journey. And powerful stories become the mythology of how we make sense of our world and create a framework for constructing meaning of our observations and experiences. Exposures to the metaphors and lessons contained within stories provide the vehicle for cultivating shared values and shared worldviews. Where groups hold disparate worldviews, one often finds conflict, misunderstanding, and resistance to cooperation as a result of holding different stories of how things have come to be the way they are. And I don't think it takes much to imagine how we're seeing that play out in the world today. An illustration related to addressing social determinants of health, which we all care about, can be seen in two common American metaphors of lifting yourself up by, by your bootstraps, contrasted with a rising tide lifts all boats, one praising self-reliance and the other prompting the benefits of collective action. Storytelling enables us to examine the connections between our personal truths and the social political realities of society with shared or disparate appreciation of how determinants influence our health and that of our neighbors. In our current moment, far too many within society and far too many policymakers in particular are still communicating and making decisions based on an over-reliance on individual agency and a minimizing of collective good. And so when I talk about photo voice, I am always thinking about that aspect of how do we create a common thread of understanding, a common thread to have us all rowing in the same direction and valuing and recognizing the root causes of the things that all of us care about. So this is just a slide I pulled to kind of show you what goes on. This is just a graphic of different countries. Um, it's a little dated, but I think it's probably still true, but blaming inequity on laziness. And you can see America ranks right up there um, relative to the, the world about how we value or overvalue um, inequities based on an individual failure. Um, Austin, if I could ask you to play this uh, YouTube link, that'd be great. Sorry, I have them backwards for you. Stand by one moment. So while he pulls that up, you're going to see somebody that you'll recognize. It's a one minute clip of somebody talking about agency. Wealth, this is according to Oxfam, of the world's 85 richest people is equal to the three and a half billion poorest people. It's fantastic. And this is a great thing because it inspires everybody, gets the motivation to look up to the 1% and say, I want to become one of those people. I'm going to fight hard to get up to the top. This is fantastic news. And of course, I applaud it. What can be wrong with this? Really? Yes, really. So somebody living on I celebrate a capitalism. dollar a day in Africa is, is getting up in the morning and saying, I'm going to be Bill Gates. That's the motivation the everybody needs. The only thing between needs. me and I'm that guy is motivation. I just need to pull up my socks. I am oh, not, wait, don't, I don't have socks. Look, don't tell me that you want to redistribute wealth again. That's never going to happen. All, okay? You know what? You take a simple stat like this, which is neither good nor bad. It's just a fact. It's a celebratory stat. I'm very excited about it. I'm wonderful to see it happen. I tell kids you know every day, if you, a, I'm just gonna, if what's Jesus wrong with this? up at a cocktail party. No, no, Amanda, one what's wrong with this statement? One possible response If you to it, work hard, you might be stinking rich We're talking one day. about people in extreme abject poverty. That's how you get three and a half no, billion No, we're not. You were just talking about really category. rich people. No. Okay. I'm going to tell you later what you should say to this. Coming up after the break, a look at China's... Oh. I wish I had your faces so I could see them. I'm sure that hits you like it hits me. Every time I see it, I can hardly believe. But we have our work cut out for us. So let's go to the foundation of photo voice. So well, O'Leary, who you just heard, but let's not even talk about him. Let's talk about somebody who's reachable. You know, when Paolo Freire, uh, built his career, um, his influence, his social activism action around 
trying to empower communities to actualize and be part of solutions within their own community. That base, that participatory base, which, you know, photo voice, if you go back to the original literature, that's the foundation of it. Feminist theory is the foundation of it. And documentary photography is the third theoretical foundation of photo voice. But that that Briarian base of conscientious raising is really the thing that makes it different as a unique strategy, a research approach, a community engagement approach. But at that core, it's really moving people from a degree of passive adaptation to something like there's nothing I can do or there's no solution to this to an intention to act. And within that um, framework of uh, Prairian critical consciousness raising is the first thing of emotional engagement to a salient issue. So something has to be risen to the level of importance and that importance or salience or that uh, emotional um, uh, consciousness raising then creates the curiosity so that a deeper understanding or a cognitive awakening can occur where social determinants and root causes of that thing that somebody's now inflamed or or emotionally engaged with can begin to take root. So to move someone from a state of passivity to a state of action, they go through this process where there's this emotional engagement to the issue and a cognitive awakening and what's causing that particular issue. So that's really the base of what we're trying to do within photo voice. But unpacking that becomes a little bit uh, of a fun process for us to, to, to ponder. So let's keep going. So we just showed uh, O'Leary, but we all have examples. Think about the person you wrote in your piece of paper that you maybe doesn't have your back or doesn't understand you that you find difficult to persuade. Well, just like uh, on JAWS, for the older folks, they'll see this, for the younger people who went back and watched this classic, at one point, Quinn says, we're gonna need a bigger boat. Well, in this case, we're gonna need a better story. We've been talking to ourselves far too long as public health people, and we have to do a better job of understanding our audience and communicating in a human way that connects with people we agree with, as well as taking some time to really investigate and understand how do we communicate with people that may not agree with us, that second person you wrote in your piece of paper. So in this process of thinking this through, we came up with a critical consciousness scale so that we could quickly assess if someone came to a photo voice exhibit, can we come up with a scale that assesses their thinking about that particular issue within a community, be exposed to the photos within an exhibit, and then do the, the quick survey at the end of the exhibit to see if we've shifted their critical consciousness on the very thing that we want them to think through. So we developed this very simple four-factor factor critical consciousness scale to see whether or not we can move people from a passive passive state about the issue to an intention to do something about it and then see if they had some emotional engagement or deeper understanding of root causes which is what we want with an exhibit and those discussions that happen at public exhibits so that's one piece of it then we wanted to do a video that described the ecological model in a different way and try to move people to understand root causes of health problems so that we're not only victim blaming so with those two things um we created a video, which you're gonna see in a second. And as you're listening to it, I want you to listen to some of the strategies we use, which we'll unpack a little bit later. But I want you to listen to the approach we took and how we're trying to talk to people that might be in our choir, in our camp. And we're also trying to talk to people who are not in our choir and maybe needs to be convinced of a different way of looking at the world around them. So as Austin gets ready to play this next slide, I will tell you in advance that one of the things we assessed was, did the video change the critical consciousness of our audience? And you can see from the small graphic, passive adaptation decreased, which is good. You want people to be less passive to the issue that they're dealing with. Um, emotional engagement to what we're attempting them to do up, went up significantly. So did cognitive awakening to root causes. And, it, and the last step was there was an increase of people with intention to do something about the thing they were just educated on. One of the curious things is that's the overall results, but we also parsed it with people who were progressive and people who were conservative on a political topology scale. And we were able to see changes of both the progressive people around understanding root causes or social determinants, as well as changes among conservative folks around an understanding and appreciation of doing something about social determinants of health. And with that, I will let Austin get ready and show us the video. It's four minutes long. Um, we'll come back and then we'll keep going. I hope you enjoy this little tidbit about the root causes of our health. 
No matter who you are, we can all make responsible choices to live a long, healthy life. The path to good health is a journey. Work hard, make healthy choices, and you'll get there. If you find yourself struggling, just keep at it. No pain, no gain. After all, a healthy country is a productive country. Um, sorry, I hate to butt in. Uh, excuse me, I'm trying to narrate a video here. Yeah, okay, but you're oversimplifying things a bit, don't you think? What do you mean? Well, for starters, you need a new perspective on this path to good health. Follow me. See? What? Why would some people's paths be different than others? That makes no sense. Well, those inclines are the conditions in which we live, work, and play. Our environmental circumstances have an enormous impact on our health, and they're why some people struggle more than others. But we all live in America. The inclines wouldn't be that different. Let me break it down for you. Our paths are influenced by things like our friends, family, and social networks, organizations and social institutions in our lives, our communities, and policies like national, state, and local laws. All the more reason to roll up your sleeves and push harder. I make the responsible choice to go to the gym every day. All it takes is discipline. Well, Jane here can't afford gym membership. Her neighborhood is too unsafe to walk in, and she doesn't have time because her daily commute is two hours by bus. You see, a lot of people like Jane are working plenty hard, but her environmental circumstances make her journey more difficult than yours. Fine. Maybe situations are different for everyone. But what are we supposed to do about that? Well, if our only strategy is to push people to try harder, we're going to get nowhere. Maybe we can make a bigger difference if we focus on reshaping our landscape. And ignore personal responsibility? How's that fair? Listen, our behavior definitely matters, but so does our environment. Address them both, and things get better all around. Take driving, for example. Driving? I'm an excellent driver. I bet you are. And there's no debating it's up to each of us to practice safe driving habits. But imagine we lived in a time before seatbelts, drunk driving laws, <gasps> or safe roads and highways. These changes saved lives and money because they didn't just focus on behavior, but on improving conditions for everyone. Okay, point taken. But how can we change the landscape to improve health? When enough people start to see the long view, we can work together to improve the landscape and make things better. And with this new perspective, decision makers and influencers, like you, can make a big difference. I'm listening. There are lots of ways to reduce the incline. Take a health topic like cigarette smoking. It could mean passing laws to raise the age to purchase cigarettes. And cultural shifts that protect our kids, like taking cigarette advertising off TV. Parents talking to their kids about the dangers of smoking. Or making hospitals smoke-free. This could apply to any health topic. Just like with our driving example, these kinds of changes to our environment help everyone by saving lives and money. Hey, all the inclines are lowering. Yep, each of these changes helped make the healthy choice the easy choice. And as you always say, A healthy country is a more productive country. Yeah, now you've got it. I guess personal responsibility does matter, but so do the actions we take to shape our landscape. With our new perspective on the long view, we can improve the path to good health for everyone. It sounds like you're ready to start making a real difference, my friend. I guess I've come around. Aren't you glad I crashed your video now? Yeah, I still don't know how you did that. So, again, I, it's a bit of a disadvantage not having you to see you, but you can see me. Hope you got uh, some, something out of that. Uh, we will, I know the slides will be available. Um, I do have a slide that's got the items of the critical consciousness scale, but so you can, you can take a peek at that, but it's available for people to use. And I encourage you to use it. It's a great way to get a pre and post of a photo voice exhibit. And I will, I'll, I'll tell you the reason we did this is um, for the researchers that are with us. You know, we would submit these grants to the NIH and often um, when you're dealing with community change and policy change, and this is photo voice lends itself to a policy change uh, intervention. And so the power within that becomes pretty small, right? It could be a community or two. So your end is very small. And oftentimes people review grants are very um, biostatic, biostats based. And so they want more uh, evidence of change. And so they would ask for changes of our participant photographers. And like you, the people in this audience, our participant, for, our participant photographers, they're not the subjects. 
they're collaborators. I mean, sure, we collect data from them. And yes, there is some impact on them. And yes, they do see things in a new way and we can measure some changes. But honestly, I'm not as curious and interested in the change of those individuals with the 10 or 20 or five or 30 that you have within a photo voice, but what they can do within their community. And so coming up with a way to do a, a grant and then embody some degree of statistical rigor to the process is what really led us to leading to develop the scale so that we could have a typical photo voice project with all the things we do with photo voice, but at the exhibit, if we get enough people from the community, you get policy decision makers from the community, now you can give this pre-post and you've got some statistical power to see if a short-term intervention of being exposed to these exhibits and thinking about root causes moves individuals, which are hopefully decision makers, to have an intention to do something. Now you've got power that's not the participant photographers, but those who you're exposing to your photo voice work. And so that's the reason we came up with the scale and the drive behind it. And I encourage you to reach out to me if you want to talk more about what that looks like. So kind of recapping, that really gets down to this policy level and this community building tool and how that can be useful for creating um, a more fundable research project to get some power around change which is necessary. Um, within photo voice, then, if we think about the process of critical consciousness, when you get to it, the, pro the photo voice process is really embedded within Friarian thinking. And so the first step is that discovery phase where you got people taking photos, interacting with your community, and then the public display. And that's where you have the the, the fodder, the power, the ammunition to move people from a state of passivity about something to being emotionally engaged and cognitively awake, awoken to the situation. And then the other side of it is once you have started that process, a good photo voice process should have the follow-up step, which is, okay, now what are you going to do about it? What are the action planning stages of it? What are the advocacy stages? We've got policymakers who are exposed to these images. We've got people who are now awakened to different ways of looking at problems. And so that social determinant message framing is what makes up the photo voice process. And with those things done well, we can see some move from passivity to action. And that's really the theoretical framework and why measuring these things within a process becomes important at the individual level beyond just your participant photographers. All right, now let's get to how do you deal with like the O'Learys of the world and the people who are mad with each other? And we can see today, you know, people yelling at each other is, is just not that successful. And I want you to think about a time and maybe you can think about that person you wrote down or, or anybody in, 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 in particular, but think about times when you went directly at someone with a point of view and reflect how successful that strategy was. Think about a time when you went directly at somebody with a point of view and reflect on how successful that strategy was. Maybe it was at a past or upcoming Thanksgiving meal where a family member said something so stupid you couldn't help but correct their faulty logic or misrepresentation of truth or the actual facts. We have Thanksgiving coming up. Hopefully you're ready for it. We have a pretty stressful election coming up for a lot of folks. Um, and we recognize that going after somebody or at somebody doesn't persuade too many people. And so thinking about that, we have to be a little more deft of hand about how to connect with other humans. Three quotes just kind of get us thinking about it. I see this as a problem, but I really do think that if you want to see change in the world, it starts with you. And the way to affect change in the world is to really spend some time affecting change in yourself first thing to do is to start changing yourself and then that will reflect in the world around you and you'll find that you're living a much richer life by doing so you've all heard this you can catch more flies with honey and vinegar why you want to catch flies i don't know but it's really around it's easier to persuade people with polite arguments and flattery than it is with being confrontational and this last one's a little harder and this is a recent author that i've really come to embrace and i'm going to read it to you and i want you to think about it but Think about that person, that, that difficult person, right? That one that you wrote down. When a person makes you suffer, it's because he suffers deeply within himself and his suffering is spilling over. He does not need punishment, he needs help. And the message, and that's the message he is sending. If you remind yourself of that when you're in these conversations or these difficult moments, that this person that you disagree with 
is actually potentially calling out for help and understanding where their fear is coming from, their, their misunderstanding, their distrust, their insular or tribal thinking. That's actually an opportunity to take a step back and rather than engaging, listen and ponder and come at the situation with a much more gentle approach so that there is some space between you and that person to be able to make some progress. It's not easy to do. And you can't do that unless you do some internal work. And the internal work helps center you on your values of how you see the world, of how you can be a part of the solution in the world. And that initial work with yourself is needed prior to being able to do what this author is trying to express with the other. But you can get there. So some of what we're going to spend a minute here talking about then is about, well, what does that look like? And Aristotle talks about different things of being persuasive. And it's really a, that's the funny thing about being human. We're all um, subject to these rules and these ways of uh, interpreting each other. And it really comes down to three things, ethos, pathos, and logos. And within that is really around argument and persuasion. So we've been hear me talk about trying to persuade people, but for the sake of understanding, let's just talk about some basic definitions. An argument is a rational presentation of opinion and the responsible meaning of opposing viewpoints. Effective arguments offer reasons for taking position on an issue. Um, whereas persuasion is a little different and we're gonna get into that, but let's keep, let's keep talking about argument for a minute. So, Within a rhetorical triangle, um, there are three elements to, to it, and we just talked about them, but it's the ethos or the character of the speaker and the goodwill, morals, and intellect. It's like basically how someone is seen within the community of individuals that are being communicated with. That's part of how we attend to, listen to, believe the person trying to make an argument or persuade us. Then there's the logical part of it. We're all familiar with that. Um, the claim, the warrant, the backing. But then the more important thing and essential thing that's part of this process is the pathos, which is the emotion and the, how the audience feels about what it is you're communicating. So think about this as the ethos is like center, the moral character of the person. Logos is the logic of the brain. And pathos is the audience and how they're interpreting the emotions of what you're providing to them. So unlike argument or a complimenting argument, I'll say persuasion is influencing others by means other than or in addition to logic. So it entails appeal to power or to emotion. And if you I make a note here, if you really want to know, there's lots of reading Foucault, uh, French and Raven that talk about power and how humans use or, or either use power or can be manipulated by power, et cetera. It's great reading to kind of get deeper into these topics. But that persuasion is necessary to have action occur. And so within these things, we spend way too much time thinking about logos and the logic of our argument and the anger of our argument. We spend less time really thinking about our character or moral standing with the person we're trying to persuade and then the emotional connection with that person. These are essential to make a difference and it's very true within photo voice. So, Given that, like which problems get attention and drive policy formation? I love this graphic. I always remind myself of it all the time. And really for, for, for issues that get attention. And you, now that I told you, you're going to look at things in life and you say, oh, that's why the government did something about X. And that's why the government's not doing something about Y. Um, but when the salience of a topic is really high, meaning is really important to a lot of people, right? and the conflict is low, there's a high likelihood that we're gonna take action on this. It's really important to us and there's no conflict about doing something about that thing. Not, not, not unanimous, but in general, if the conflict is low and the salience of an issue is high, there's likely to be action. But a lot of, oftentimes that's not the case. And so we'll have lower attention to an issue and we'll have a lot of conflict. And in those situations, there's not likely to be a lot of action. Um, and of course, there's different things within that grid of understanding that don't fall cleanly. And there is certainly some bifurcation in society about, well, this is salient to me and not to others. This is high conflict to me, but not to others. So that occurs too. But in general, if you think about why something is or isn't being attended to, it really comes down to a graphic like this that really tries to take a complex situation and say, it's not so complicated. 
There's conflict about it. I don't need to do anything about it. There's high agreement on it. I'm on board. So just think about issues within society, the thing you're trying to persuade with that frame of mind. It might be important to you and it might be important to people around you, but it might not be important to that person that you're trying to persuade and how to get that person to have a higher salience for the thing that you think is salient is part of the trick of your key or how to reduce conflict around the thing. So we're going to talk a little bit about persuasion still. And you, you're familiar with this person. I gave you this quote to begin with because you know this quote from Neil Armstrong. This is one small step for man, a giant leap for mankind. That one you're familiar with. But this one I'm sure you're not familiar with. But I really like it relative to persuasion and relative to argument. In flying, the probability of survival is inversely proportional to the angle of arrival. So I've got a little graphic there of planes landing. So just think about it. If you're in an airplane and you're landing at a very shallow angle coming in very gradually and you hit the and you hit the runway and you land very gently, that's a that's a very comfortable way to come in. There's no fear of dying as opposed to coming landing at a very steep angle, you're not likely to survive. And the steeper your angle is, the less likely you are to survive. The same thing is true when you're communicating with another human being. So when you are trying to make a point or try to make a friend or to try to persuade somebody, think about the angle of your approach. So earlier we talked about the Sisyphus wedge and then the ecological model being the lower that is, the easier it is to get up the hill in society. This is the same thing in reverse, where the, 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 the lower, the, the shallow angle is a much better way to bring people into your line of thinking. So as you're approaching somebody, keep that in mind relative to the way you're trying to persuade. If you think about the video that you saw earlier, this video um, did a lot of things that we've been talking about here. It used humor. It used an understanding of values. It it paid attention to a progressive and a conservative, a collective and an individualistic mindset. It gave a nod to some of the arguments that someone might make. Like, I get to the gym every day. I'm fine. Why don't you get to the gym? All right, so that's an argument about that individual agency versus a collective understanding that, well, not everybody has a nine to five job and has enough money to join the gym, right? So you have to give credit or awareness to these points of view and give it give it enough breathing room to be aired so that then you can unpack it and that video did a nice job i feel of doing some of those things like the no pain no gain kind of motif the i did it why can't you do it the why should we care about that person's journey argument uh, and if you heard also the video talked about the value of a productive society of people being successful. And if the society, if people are successful within a society, the society is successful. So it's not a big leap to see somebody who maybe has a, a very uh, particular mindset about society where everybody's on their own, lift yourself up by your bootstraps, no pain, no gain, would also value and benefit from everybody contributing in a way that gets the highest economic factor for the government or for the the nation, et cetera. So you can you can you can you can use a person's value for the direct persuasion of why it's important for us to support everybody and to have programs that allows for everybody to be productive. So you, I, hopefully you're seeing what I'm talking about is really dissecting those values of your audience and bring, being able to use that for persuasion of the very point you're trying to get them to do. So I want you to do something. This will be just a little experiment. Take your hand and make a fist. Make it really tight. And I want you to take your other hand and I want you to try to peel back your fingers. Just, just try to peel your fingers away. And as you peel your fingers away, as you try to attempt to peel your fingers away, do you feel your, harm, your hand gripping tighter? You, you can't even possibly open your hand because your clenched fist is stronger than your fingers trying to open it up. Now I want you to take your same hand and I want you to gently place it in your hand and just rest it in there and then pay attention to what happens to your fingers. They're not as tight as they once were just a couple seconds ago. I mean, they're not, they might not be open, but they're also not rigid. And when you think about approaching somebody, a good way to remind yourself is to think about that fist and think about you going into talking with somebody, 
council person, your principal, a teacher, coworker, and think about that clenched fist and how successful you are and think about the open palmed hand and think about what that does to the resistance within the clenched fist. And if that helps you, that will begin to open up a new way of approaching all kinds of situations and relationships in your life. So kind of, so you have some skills and some tools. This box is something that I like to use, and this will be a little more detailed of some of the points that we've been making, <clears throat> but it becomes a nice vehicle for asking yourself how to understand your audience. So this message box, you kind of start with, we'll kind of step through the exam, the, the, the definitions here, but the first thing you want to do is you want to state the problem that you're trying to change. And so here you define the problem and be sure to frame it as much as you can at initial to the audience's values in mind. Frame the causal issues leading up to as well as those resulting from the problem. So you're, you're identifying the problem and maybe some of the root causes of it and some of the outcomes of the problem. So you're really looking at the problem in totality. It's the current situation, what led to it, and what that problem results in, right? So you start there. Um, then you can do a little bit deeper dive and ask yourself, okay, now, who exactly is the audience for this problem? Like, who is that? Per is it the council person? Is it the media? Is it your immediate coworker? Is it your boss? Um, is it the state level, et cetera? But think about who your audience is for, for the persuasion. And with that, you wanna get really specific about who you're trying to persuade. And you want to understand what powers they have so that, and, and whether or not they can actually do the thing you want them to do, whether they can do the ask. There's more to it, of course, but just in basic, that's kind of what you're thinking. You're going to want to think about who their allies are, who, the, who, their, who the people they trust and rely on are, who their in-groups are, who their out-groups are. Just really try to analyze who your audience is. Then you're going to get to the values. And with this, we're not talking about your values. I mean, you need to know yourself, no doubt about it. But you're really trying to understand your audience's values, the person you're trying to persuade. Why does this or should this issue matter to them? How do you make them care and reflect their values and their priorities? The very, this is very important. To persuade, you really have to spend time thinking about what are their values? What do they care about? They care about keeping their money. They care about helping this community have a program. They care about whether or not everybody has a job. They care about whether or not everybody's on welfare or not. So whatever those things are, think about their values and then really script that. And you might not know these. You might have to spend some time listening. And listening is a key skill. The older you get, the better I think you get at listening. Um, so spend some time with this one because it's a little bit harder, but really spend some time reading, talking, and listening. And now, after you've done that, after you spent some time thinking about the values, go back to the problem now. Now see if you can redefine the problem with their values more in mind as best you can, because it'll be important. Then with that in mind, you need to spend some time thinking about what are the barriers? What are the things you're gonna get away of potential solutions, keeping their values in mind? So you list those barriers out and this becomes the rebuttal or the counter argument. So you wanna kind of spend some time thinking about what's gonna get in the way of this happening document what you think their barriers they're going to state are, and then make sure that you come up with some rebuttals or some answers for those barriers. Maybe you're going to minimize why it's not important. Maybe you're going to provide a solution to how that barrier is really not going to be the barrier they are concerned with. Or maybe you'll convince them that the solution is more important than the barrier that they think will get in the way. But you have to spend some time dissecting and understanding what those barriers are so that you have some ammunition for the potential rebuttal. Then you need to spend some time setting up a roadmap for the solutions. And this is where you can get the audience, remember keeping their values, get them excited about the potential of how their idea, maybe it's your idea, but you want them to think it's their idea, how they can get excited about the solutions. You've already gone through their values. You've already identified the problem from their point of view. You've already addressed their barriers. Now you're going to get them excited about the values that underlie um, their vision and how they can they can provide the solution themselves. And with that, you're more likely to get to the ask, which is the one thing that you think they can do, the next thing that you want them to do. Don't try to do everything, just try to focus on what's that next thing that we can get them to agree to. So we've been talking a little bit about your angle of attack, you know, the shallower, the better. We've been talking about American values and understanding that everybody thinks a little bit differently within our society. 
we've been taking a step back to kind of say, hey, wait a minute. We have this issue that we care about. We've done this photo voice project. We know it's needed. We know it's important to the community. But not doing this groundwork and not doing the self-reflection and then understanding of your audience is going to be a sure way if you have a steep angle of attack and not get what you want. Take a shallower attack, do this work, do this analysis, understand your audience, and use tools like the, this message box and other strategies to really get into how we can reframe and redirect another person's uh, feelings, ethos and pathos. Logos is important, but the others are necessary in order to have logos even have a chance to have an audience. Make sure that those are present within your argument. So I, I know you can't really see me, but this book, it's called The Art of Communication by Ted Hutton. It's one of his last, he died just recently, this past year and a half. He was a, a Vietnamese monk that uh, Martin Luther King nominated for a Nobel Peace Prize back in the 60s. He's been around a long time, set up Plum Village, which is a monastery meditation retreat in France. It was actually built on a place where they buried a lot of the World War I think I'm sure it was one or two um, uh, people on that grounds, and he used that as the grounds. Everybody said it was haunted, but he actually made it a rejuvenation center. And his writing is just beautiful. And he's got this book on the art of communication. And I just put a quote up there, and I'm going to read it to you, but I just want you to listen as I read it, and then we can do some Q&A and just have a discussion. But I want you to think about this relative to that difficult person, or even the person you love. Think As I read it, I want you to think about those two individuals. And I want to think about you and your positioning of how you think of yourself as a human and how you can or don't, how effective you are connecting with another person, but also how you can improve on that connection. And we're all a work in progress, so don't ever beat yourself up about this. But so here we go. When you plant lettuce, if it does not grow well, you do not blame the lettuce. You look for reasons for it not doing well. It may need fertilizer or more water or less sun. You never blame the lettuce. Yet, if we have problems with our friends or family, we blame the other person. But if we know how to take care of them, they will grow well like lettuce. Blaming has no positive effect at all, nor does trying to persuade using reason and argument. That is my experience. No blame, no reasoning, no argument, just understanding. If you understand and you show that you understand, you can love and the situation will change. And with that, I just want to say it's been fun doing this, but I have a conversation. But let's have a conversation uh, and any questions or insight you have for all of us. I'm asking Laura to come back online with us. Um, so she can help me with this. Um, but I did, before I do that, I did say that I was going to show you the picture that I took. And so here's the photo. Um, my daughters won't like me because they don't know that I use this. Well, but there's the photo that I was taking. This was in Brooklyn. My daughter moved there about a year and a half ago. So, so there you go. Let's have a, let's have a conversation and I'll ask Austin and Laura to help by opening up the, the channels. Thank, thank you, Bob, so much. That was incredible. It my mind is still pondering all all what you've spoken about, and I invite everybody to write you know, to comment and say the three things that oh that'd be wonderful takeaways, and then we have a record in the chat, and and Bob can see it quickly. While people are doing that, I just want to say that, you know, some of this fun experience is just for those who are like thinking and typing, but reading and exploring different things outside of your norm is so powerful. And um, for those who haven't caught on to Krista Tippett's On Being, Krista Tippett, it's a, it's a podcast called On Being. Her name is Krista Tippett. She's been doing it for, gosh, I don't know, 20 years I mean, there's hundreds of these conversations with really thoughtful people, poets, philosophers, political leaders, 
activists, um, you name it. Um, but I have gotten so much benefit from being around people that forced me to examine my own way of being. Mm -hmm. So. Thank you. We have a, quite a few coming through. Thank you so much, everybody. I'm having a little trouble seeing it. It says it's so narrow. The scale, pre-test, post-test, yes. Awesome. Excellent. We need a better story for that change. I see a comment, too, where someone raised a hand. I don't know if Austin can open a channel for somebody or not. Yes, Lucy. Hi, Lucy. Thank you so much. Um, this was fascinating and really motivating as a somewhat new um, photo voice um, activist and researcher and participant. Um, I'm really interested in the action piece and I'm about to go to um, Istanbul to present some findings of a photo voice project to some policymakers. And I'm just wondering in your experience, what is the reaction that you get from people? Um, I come from a qualitative research background and sort of, you know, community engagement. So I, and I think everybody on this call believes that this is really meaningful and soulful um, way of understanding people's perspectives. But I also know there are a lot of people who really want rigor and quantitative evidence and the sort of cut and dried. So what are your recommendations to get that kind of person to um, value this approach? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a, it's a fair question. And when I've heard my whole career, I, I do think that <laughs> I do think the conversation ebbs and flows over the, the validity or the generalizability of various approaches. So the, both of those things are always important for sure. And I don't think you should dismiss the request of what people are asking you to do while still defending and arguing the outputs that you're providing. So I do think there is some credence given to qualitative and more participatory approach especially when it leads to uh, evidence of systems changes. Um, for what it's worth, you should get, gather up and have at the ready evidence of uh, approaches like photo voice or qualitative approaches that have resulted in an outcome that people that people value. So going, going back mm -hmm. to the presentation, thinking about what people value, yes, they want evidence, but if you can, uh, they want power. Um, and they have their frame of thinking, so their mental frame you have to understand. But they also want, an, a, a, they want science, and, and using your, your, your question, they want science to demonstrate some outcome. So you need to be thinking about what is that outcome and how can I provide evidence of it? And you, you, you can go back to Carolyn Wong's original photo voice project and how mm -hmm. it resulted in some very specific systems changes for the uh, farming, the, uh, the poor individuals of the Yunnan province. You know, I've had plenty of, we, you know, Carolyn, um, Marianne Burris, Robin and I did an article where we talked about the history, our experience with photo voice over the years. And Marianne, who was with Carolyn Wong in China when they did the Yunnan province, talked about all the great things that that photo voice project resulted in. That's evidence. Um, so power can be measured in different ways. And so I'm encouraging to have those pieces of evidence where a qualitative participatory approach actually got the end result Whereas a quantitative method might be statistically powerful, but in the real world, not effective. So you can provide those evidence. Um, and if you need to, like the scale that we developed was to do exactly what you're talking about, which is to get quote unquote power by having uh, data collected from the people who are exposed to your, your exhibits. That's another way to go about it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I love Jenny. I love your trying to understand and be kind comment. Yes, it's we're all we're all doing that every daily, and it's never ending. A number of people have mentioned the angle, the landing angle, as something that has that struck them. Don't you love that? 
Mm -hmm. I, I, when I first read that quote this summer and you asked me to talk, I said, I'm going to use that because it means something. I have to explain it to people. But once you, once you think about it and you think about landing and getting in an air, I had a whole visualization story. I was going to have people thinking about landing on a scary plane. But when you think about it, it really does make a difference of how effective you are. Think about it when you're at Thanksgiving and Uncle Hank is there saying something stupid. That'll help you. <laughs> okay. Not that I know you have an Uncle Hank, Laura. I'm just speculating if somebody has oh, an Uncle well, Hank. We all have an Uncle Hank. Yeah, let's not go there <laughs> for the moment. The uh, Another uh, comment that's come up is the advocacy message box. And and I want to, I think it's brilliant. And I wondered, is that available? I mean, we can make our own. Is it is it okay to use it? Do we? Yeah, do we, abs oh, absolutely. You mention where we got it. What What's the right way to use it? Yeah, well, you you can have. I'm assuming that they'll have access to these slides, so you've got it there for sure. Um, to be honest with you, where I first was exposed to this way of approaching things was when I used to make visits to Washington with Sophie, and Sophie Society for Public Health Education used to do a very routine advocacy summit, and one of the Hill staffers. Um, provided that as a frame. It was slightly different. I've modified it since that initial one, but um, provided a, a, a very similar mnemonic for how to talk and persuasively to a uh, legislator. Uh, and so taking that pause to understand the other and the values of the other was really the main point. But um, I would actually have to do a little research to see if I can find the original sources of that. But please use this as is. I do it with my students or have, used to do it with my students when oh, I was teaching more. We, we can always uh, let people know a little citation that would relate to your talk. Oh, that's fine. If they want to. You Definitely know, no use pressure. it. No pressure. Um, I heard you say, yes, you're all right with us sharing this slides in a yes. PDF? Okay. So that was a question in the chat. Thank you so much. I, I know I'm going to be watching this recording of your presentation uh, multiple times. There's a lot to, to learn. And that idea of the angles of landing and the angles of pushing up the hill, it's kind of interesting how you brought angles into this conversation. Yeah. Thanks. I will say, too, while you're looking at the other comments for everybody out there, we, the the, Sisyphus, the, the the person pushing the rock up the hill, that's Sisyphus. It's based on the mythology of Sisyphus, who was condemned to pushing a rock up the hill and have it roll back down. But it was a different way of framing the ecological, the socio-ecological model. Um, and I found it to be very effective. That's why we put the video together. That is available. I mean, it's embedded in this presentation, but I'll send to you a YouTube link so anybody can use it. So mm -hmm. anybody out there, if you're teaching or if you're trying to persuade a policymaker, I find it a quick four minute way to kind of get people up to speed of how to think about our environment in a different way. Hopefully mm -hmm. you found it useful. I'm, I want people to use that skill and that tool. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll make sure that people have access to the YouTube link for it. Thank you. I'm seeing the uh, someone commenting on the power of self-awareness of one's self-realities when working with different people. That's something that struck that uh, viewer. Read this book. <laughs> yes. That, well, you're providing us not just with the talk, but with resources to, to if we say, embed this change, in these changes and, I right. want, and, and changes in viewpoint and action. And I want to thank you for that. I realize it's four o'clock and I don't you know, want to... Um, you assume that you could stay after four o'clock or not, and but uh, we're happy. We'd be happy to talk a few more minutes, but I also know you may have pressures on your time. I really appreciate the comments that people are making, and I do for for people who can. Like um, I'll put it in here. Um, uh, this is I'm putting my email in here for folks. So I do really, I do want to hear from you. Um, I want to hear about the things that you got out of it, things that we can continue to evolve and refresh and redo, um, questions that you have. We have some tools and some and, re, and so forth. Our photo voice kit, we're opening up for folks to be able to use. I know Laura does a lot of trainings um, and we've talked a lot about some tools that can be useful within photo voice. So 
I just want to thank you for inviting me to come and do this, but I can stay for some more time if people have questions or comments. I, um, oh, thank you. And I see a, an, a question here in the question and answer box for Zoom. Can you please explain more about the survey used during the exhibition? Do you do a pre-survey before the exhibition starts or how do you evaluate? Yeah, no, it's exactly what we've done. <clears throat> so when we design the the, the sort of the four factor critical consciousness scale, um, which has nine items, so there's basically two items to each piece of the scale, and the scale is passive adaptation, emotional engagement, cognitive awakening, and intentions to act. And it's on a five it's on a five point Likert scale: strongly disagree to strongly agree. Um, you would just print these off with that scale attached to each of these things. And we've worded it in a way that it's um, it's generic. So in other words, it doesn't ask about social determinants. It says, you know, this problem or concern that whatever the exhibit is, is something we should all care about. So you, no matter what your uh, photo voice exhibit is about, it is for that topic. It's really around the understanding of consciousness around an issue of concern and so you can use this as is and do a pretest, which, you know, it only takes people 30 seconds to fill out or maybe a minute to fill out going into an exhibit. So you'd give it to them going into an exhibit. You know, for anybody who's done a number of photo voice projects, you really do want to have time for hopefully your photographers to be present to interact with individuals. The best way is to get decision makers there. You get them to interact with individuals, they look at the photos, they start thinking about, well, gosh, this really is kind of concerning. And like, why why is this happening? Well, my experience is my mom works and so well, like my brother doesn't get any help at home. And so they can't do well in school. It's now this policy makers beginning to understand the situation a little bit better. So their emotional awareness of the thing starts getting infused with some root cause analysis and then the decision maker says, well, gosh, we've got these after school programs and we need to provide transportation to get people to them. Right. You with me? Mm -hmm. So then you can do a post survey using the exact same scale. So now you got an exact measure of the same instrument before they come into the exhibit and after they come into the exhibit. And it's a pretty easy nine item, five uh, response uh, cross tab. So almost anybody can do it. And if you don't work with your local university and they can help you line up somebody to help you do that analysis. Um, but it's a nice quick way to get a pre-post of your exhibit's power. Mm. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate that. Then you are measuring the audience change. You're not introducing a measure uh, with participants. And I've tried that, a, you know, a time or two, and I, I do find it off-putting. I, I don't feel comfortable necessarily bringing in a scale um, for, for participants to complete. Right. And so this is, this is the, when you say audience, see, I think of it differently. I think of my photographers as my co-researchers. Yes. I don't, I don't, sure they're participating, but I really do think of them as the experts for, I'm the interloper. My mm -hmm. photographers are the experts. So if anything, I'm participating with them. So I think of the photographers as my co-researchers, and I think of the people we're exposing to the images as the audience. Mm -hmm. That's how I think about it. And so in terms of in inter photo voice intervention, I think of those people out there yet to be defined as the people I'm trying to influence and interact and persuade, meaning the participants of the research study. So that's for, for framing, that's how I've always approached it. Yes. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I think maybe we need you need to create a a measure for for facilitators then. <laughs> it could be good. Yeah. I see another fan out here of uh, of Krista Tippett. Exactly. I can't speak highly enough of how much you get out of it. So thank you for that, Zara. I I always like to have a co fan. If you hear a, if you hear a good episode they haven't heard, send it to me. Here's a, a question from uh, Garen Phillips. I'm thinking of using critical consciousness in my photo voice research paper on experiences of beach cleanup volunteers. I think it would be very useful. Do you perhaps have any advice on implementing it in this context? 
I, I will be, I, yeah, I mean, I would just use it as is, I would imagine. Um, although I don't know enough about what you're describing, but anytime you expose an individual to a new awareness of their surroundings, you would hope, as Freire would, that there's some consciousness raising about that issue. So um, I think it could be used in any, any it can be used in any context where you expect someone to have a new um, sensitization to an issue and the root causes of that issue. I encourage you to do that, yeah. Yeah, good. I'm just at, I'm suggesting people feel free to raise your hand if you would like to ask a question, uh, you know, verbally as opposed to typing. Two participant, two people have raised their hands. Okay, Mariela, would you like to go first? Hi, good afternoon from Costa Rica. All right. So, <laughs> so I have, I really enjoyed this talk. Thank you. And it really elicited a lot of more questions, but also more passion, which is always good. Um, so your, your scale have... Have you tested with in other languages besides English? Because we are in the process of starting a affordable project um, with immigrant moms, that uh, doulas, and healthcare providers. That you know, so it's going to be multilingual. But I, and we are hoping to have an exhibit. So I think that I will, and we and we were struggling to find a way to quote unquote show impact, right? Um, so and particularly because we really want to have a more understanding of what is maternal child health while an immigrant in Wisconsin, where that project will take place. So I was wondering if you have it in Spanish and if not, if that's a, if this could be a possible way to collaborate. Well, the first question is we have not done it in Spanish, but we have done it in Swahili and Key Swahili. So uh, we used it in a project in Kenya around HIV. Um, and actually just put in another NIH grant to, to, to do it, it, extended more work with it as well. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, I, I would welcome people to, that's what research is about, right? Collaborating, trying to expand knowledge, trying to create tools for others to you know, keep going with the growth process. So yeah, reach out to me and um, I'll make sure you have the article which has the scale in it, which is also in the slideshow. But uh, after that, we can... Um, whatever I can do to help you make your project success, successful, uh, I'll certainly try to do that. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yes, I downloaded the article already, so I will read <laughs> it later. Thanks. Yeah. Hold on. The, uh, we've got two of them. One is on the critical consciousness scale, and then in the presentation, there's another one that is on the use of the scale for the evaluation of the video that you saw. And that's where you, I showed you the data yeah. where we were able to show that people did shift in their thinking after watching that short video. Yeah. Um, so we do know that the scale has some validity and reliability relative to measuring some of those constructs. Yeah, um, go both of them. Yeah. <laughs> They're ready in my inbox, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mariela. Does, I don't see the another hand raised right now. Anybody else? Two. Here's another one. All right. So <clears throat> maybe you can, would, maybe you're, oh, good. Here we go. Maybe it'll show. Diana? Okay. Hi. Hi. This is Diana calling from Vermont. All right. Hey. Oh, so you Have are... the leaves changed yet? Uh, beautiful. Yes. Yeah. You might get a lot of North Carolina people. After our hurricane here, people are a little worried about going up the mountains and burdening and we've got a lot of leaf peepers in the mountains here. And so it's, uh, it's the leaf changing season here has got everybody anxious because of the hurricane and what it's meant to our local economies. So mm -hmm. like you're in Vermont, I, I, I know right now is about when leaves change. I'm from Michigan, so leaves change earlier up there. And what I'm doing right here, what I'm modeling a little bit right here is I'm pausing the question that you're gonna ask to demonstrate a little bit of shared humanity. And now that we're having a conversation about leaf changing, we feel differently about each other. And in the talk, that's some of what I was trying to do. And so I just wanted to model just a little bit about how these things are important. So sorry, sorry to no. dis distract you from your question, but I was trying to like take an opportunity to connect with you. Um, 
so the example that you gave of uh, the people on the different inclines, yeah, right, and how their environment or per or their just their circumstances put them at either an advantage or a disadvantage, depending on the steepness of the incline. Yeah. Well, I just wanted to tell you that there's a really, really powerful video on YouTube that was posted seven years ago that I've never forgotten that demonstrates that exact same point. Nice. They have all these young people lined up like at the starting line of a race. Oh yeah. You know, and they, and then, but then they ask each person, you know, he makes a few statements like, you know, tell me if, um, you know, you, you if single mom or two parents or right. Exactly. Or, or, you know, your parents went to college or, you know, you, um, you have, um, had, you know, a, the advantage of a, of a college education or whatever, and then take two steps forward, you know, yep. take two steps forward. And then there's some people who are, you know, they start the race, you know, eight steps ahead. And then the other people are still on the starting line because none of, those, none of those privileges applied to them. I mean, the, 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 the example is a wonderful example. I'm not <laughs> right. I'm not saying, yeah, but then you're right. That's called a privilege walk. Um, yeah. And it's, I used to do it with my adolescent health class and I'd put them in the stairs and I would do exactly what you're describing. Um, and I had it prescripted for around adolescence, but by the end of the take a step up the step or step down the step. Some of the students were at the, the doors of the college entry building. And some of them were literally in the middle of the road, getting ready to hit by a car and walk crosswalk. And it was, it, you're right. That privilege walk example is so powerful. And I'll say this too. I did this with my faculty just uh, uh, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago. We were talking about, I'm extending your story. Yeah. But, I, but I'm partly doing it because we fall victim to our own um, attribution failures all the time. So what happens is we end, we tend to we tend to give ourselves credit for the things that we do successful based on effort. And for other people, if they don't do something, we blame them for not doing it based on their effort. But and when we don't do something well, a lot of times we'll blame it on our environment. I had to pick the kids up. I've got too much going on. My boss is giving me too much work you know, my computer stopped working. Those are all environmental things, not effort. So when things don't go well for us, we tend to blame our environment. But if things don't go well for others, we blame them for their effort and we don't give credit to their environment for hampering them. And as we do this all the time, even teachers do this. And so I was reminding our faculty about attribution error. And I did our own little version of a privilege walk with our faculty recently to remind them that not everybody has uh the ability to not work, right? Some people have to work to pay rent. So thank you for that example. You're right. There are other ways to model this and that is a very powerful one. Absolutely. Thank you. Again, uh, I'm, uh, I can't express my appreciation enough for this wonderful presentation and inspiration um, for my work going forward, I, I need to own that and and hopefully for others as well. I imagine so, based on all these comments and the discussion. So um I I the chat is slowing down and I don't see any more hands raised right now. So I think it might be a good time to take a pause and and any last question, please let us know before we uh we close the session. Thank you all for letting me come here and everything and, and have a great rest of the conference. Um, I know that uh, uh, you've got some great speakers coming up and I know Nina Wallerstein uh, agreed to do a talk. And if you haven't read Nina Wallerstein's work or you no, don't know her, she's an amazing researcher and a really sharp person. So uh, make sure that you tune in for what she has to say. And thanks for letting me come and share the, some of these thoughts with everybody. Oh, so appreciating. Thank you so much, Bob. And thank you, everyone who's been here today.